Well, good evening, and welcome to Copernic Observatory. It's great to uh, see some uh, some familiar faces and some some new faces, um, and also welcome to those watching on our live stream. Uh, my name is Drew Desker. I'm the director uh, here at uh, at Copernic, and um, every Friday we do this. We uh, give you an opportunity to uh, explore some aspect of science or technology, or something new, or right, well, no, new, but uh, something connected, like artwork. But uh, if you, this is where, you, where sort of the, steam, the, the, the A in steam comes into, into effect. Um, just by show of hands here, who's, um, who's here for the first time? All right, super. Great, uh, great to have you. Now, who here is a member? Pretty much the other half. <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Well, for those people that raised their hand second um, actually have an available piece of information about how uh, valuable uh, Copernic membership is. Uh, Copernic belongs to uh, an organization called the ASCC, the Association of Science and Technology Centers. And uh, your Copernic membership gets you into over 350 other science centers for free. So you could go to the Roberson Museum. You could go to the Ithaca Science Center. You could go to uh, the Intrepid down in New York City or the Franklin Institute, all for free, uh, using a, a Copernic membership. So uh, if you do any traveling, if you like this kind of place, uh, a Copernic membership is actually, uh, you can actually, uh, especially like for the family, um, you'll find that uh, you'll more than save the cost of your one day trip to the, say, Franklin Institute than for the whole year of a, of a Copernic membership. Um, on our website, we talk about um, the things we, we do here. Uh, there's a, a, a wide range of stuff. Uh, today, we're in fact uh, we're promoting obviously our, um, our our Friday night program, but we also have um, other things. Like right now, we are running our summer camp. We just uh, today finished up a uh, summer camp on uh, rocket design. We had uh, 18 uh, rocket engineers uh, launching. Uh, over the, over the week, they started with uh, sort of commercial designs, and then today they put their own design together and went down to the field and had a great time uh, launching that. So uh, most of our camps actually are full, but we do have uh, a few openings still, including uh, one in a couple weeks uh, that uh, Jeremy Cardi, who's actually driving our live stream this evening, uh, runs. It's called the it's a virtual reality camp for for middle school kids. So if uh, you want to check that out, go to our website. There's still a, a couple of spots there as well. But again, every Friday night we, uh, we do this. And um, uh, what's interesting is when COVID hit, we had to sort of stop uh, offering people an opportunity to come here. We thought, well, maybe a couple of weeks, this COVID thing will be done. And obviously, it wasn't. So uh, uh, soon, well, when we sort of figured out it wasn't going to be a short-term thing, we decided to go live streaming. So actually, our, for about a year and a half, all of our presenters would zoom into us, and we would just put it back out on our on our, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, we've done a number of pretty high-profile uh, uh, YouTube uh, live streams. Uh, one back at the end of uh, 2020, where the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction, we had over 4,000 people on our YouTube stream at the same time. And just back in May, uh, does anybody remember that? Uh, the lunar eclipse that happened mid-May, all right? Well, fortunately, uh, we actually had a pretty clear skies here. And uh, Jeremy put a camera on one of our scopes and uh, did a, a, it was about a, about a five hour live stream, I think it was, uh, on the entire eclipse. And at one point, we had over 25,000 people on our live stream. In fact, in the comments, people were saying, and no shade on NASA, but people were saying, we like your stream better than NASA's. So uh, um, if you're unable to you know, make a, a Friday night, check out, our, uh, check out our YouTube stream. And what's also nice is that those uh, presentations are stored on YouTube. So even if you're not available at all, you could, in fact, you could go and check out that, uh, uh, that Eclipse uh, YouTube. But anyway, uh, tonight we have an opportunity to sort of um, look at uh, you know, how is it that we uh, try to perceive something we, we've never seen before. And um, Joe Bergeron has been doing this kind of work for 
Since 1976. 76. All right. Um, and so, uh, and Joe actually uh, also comes up here and helps out. Uh, you know, his he'll bring scopes up and and uh, does does his own, uh, his own observing and shares his scopes with us as well. So, we are going to turn the uh, event over to uh, to Joe. Although I will say, if you're watching on the live stream and you're in a financial position to do so, there's a uh, down below there's a an opportunity to to donate. So if you're in a position to do so, um, we would appreciate it. It helps. Uh, Helps us pay for the equipment and uh, and the time to uh, to make this happen. So we're going to now switch over to Joe's presentation and take it away, Joe. Thank you, Drew. Do you have my audio? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, can I get most of the lights turned out in here? Yeah. And uh, there we go. So hi, my. I'm Joe Bergeron. I'm a local boy. I've been working as a space artist for a long time. In fact, um, Drew and I are high school alumni from the same class at uh, Maine Endwell. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. So, I'm going to, I'm starting out with this image because I want to show you that it's possible to uh, produce this kind of artwork and eventually get good at it if you keep working at it. So this was actually one of the first things I produced um, back in the 70s, early 70s, probably the first time I ever had an airbrush in my hand. Um, why was I doing this? Well, for one thing, I was working at Robertson Planetarium at the time. And um, I was producing shows, and we didn't have much of a budget. And uh, so I needed, if we wanted visuals to show in the dome, uh, I often I would have to make them myself. And uh, I basically taught myself how to paint in order to do that. So this is a very early and primitive thing that I produced around that time. I don't think I used that in a planetari planetarium show, but it still exists. And it's intended to be encouraging for anybody who uh, might be interested in becoming a space artist. <laughs> and uh, if you can do this well, you have the potential to get better. So uh, this is artwork I produced um, as a result of the total solar eclipse in the early 90s. I forget if it was 91 or 92. Um, I was down in uh, La Paz, Mexico to uh, see this eclipse. And I took primitive photos, and I did visual observations. And when I got home, I produced this artwork based on what I saw. And the next time, that, that sounds better right away, yeah. The next so total solar eclipse is, is uh, in April, uh, April 8, 2024. And it's actually total in parts of New York State in the uh, northern part and the far western part. Um, so this is basically an advertisement for that eclipse. Uh, now you might think that, well, okay, it's total if I drive a couple hundred miles, but if I stay here, it's 99% or something, and that sounds pretty good. But I want to tell you that the difference between a 99% eclipse and a total eclipse is vast, astronomical. You are seeing almost nothing if you, if you stay here for a 99% eclipse. I advise you to do whatever you have to to get into the band of totality for that eclipse and preferably beneath clear skies or you're going to be really frustrated. So, okay, I do a lot of digital artwork. This is a, an illustration I produced for um, an astronomy textbook. And it's intended to be like the primordial Earth and Moon when they were, they were just still accreting from random bits of debris floating around in the solar system. They were both really hot and uh, partially molten on their surfaces. And you can see an impact taking place on the uh, Earth there in the foreground. And that is purely digital. 
this too is digital and it depicts more or less the same thing but it's just more colorful and um, it's set in the nebula in which the solar system is thought to have formed so it's not a black starry sky like we're accustomed to now it's lots of glowing gas and uh, dark dust And here's the result, our current planet and uh, the moon in the distance. Uh, that's a painting. It's not digital. That's an acrylic painting. Uh, let's see, geography. You can see South America and a good part of uh, the southeastern United States up there. This is the kind of thing I used to do pretty frequently. Question? Yeah. On the previous one? Uh-huh. Star map. Is that in no, okay. no. It's uh, most of, most of the star fields in my paintings are completely arbitrary and random, because trying to make them realistic, too much work. I mean, accurate, okay. not yeah. Too much work. Question. Yes. What's the black spot on South America? Oh, um, well, it's it's not intended to be a black spot. Uh, in the real painting, it's a dark green, and that would be the Amazon rainforest. OK, so now we're looking over the shoulder of the moon towards the Earth, and there's a comet out beyond them. This is another acrylic painting. You're seeing the back side of the moon, or the far side, uh, which is uh, almost totally saturated with craters and it does not have the dark lava plains that we see on our side of the moon that we call Maria or it has very little instance of those so yeah if if the far side of the moon was the uh, side that was pointed towards us it would the moon to the naked eye would look a lot more boring because there would be very little detail on it. You could see it would just look like a whitish ball. No man in the moon. So this is what, what might happen if a comet came really, really close to the Earth. This is a digital piece. Uh, things like this have happened in the past. Uh, the uh, 1910 apparition of Comet Halley, I think it was 1910. Um, is that right? Yes. Something like that. Well, the Earth actually passed through the tail of the comet, the apparition. Now, I don't think the head of the comet got that close, but it was close enough so that we did pass through the tail. And people were worried about that because uh, it contained trace amounts of the element or the compound cyanogen, which is, which is toxic. And so certain people were selling anti-comet pills, so so people would survive. Yeah, and they made a, I guess they made some money doing that. They were probably just sugar pills. So okay, this is an oil painting of the Grand Canyon, not really very astronomical. But what I did with it was uh, I messed around with it to simulate how the light changes there over the course of the day. So this is how it looks near sunset, more or less. <laughs> and this is how it looks at night if there's a moon. And this is how it looks at night if there's no moon. <laughs> and I've seen it plenty of times looking just like that. You can see absolutely nothing in that huge hall at night when there's no moon. Nothing. Unless there's a light down at Phantom Ranch or some hikers struggling out with their flashlights on one of the trails. Okay, this is another digital piece. It's kind of fanciful. It's uh, calling it Greek astronomy because it illustrates a couple of uh, the ancient constellations. You see Scorpius, uh, the scorpion there on the right, and Sagittarius. The archer, who is also a centaur, on the left, and the moon, and um, in between Sagittarius and the moon, a bright red object that's Mars. I put it there because um, 
Well, when I made this image, that's where Mars was in the sky. And just to the right of the moon, and a little below, is the red star in Teres, which looks pretty similar to Mars, similar color. And that explains its, co its name, Ant Aries, the opposite of Aries, or the uh, Greek name for Mars, because uh, it was supposed to be the arrival of Mars because it looks similar to uh, the planet Mars. Yeah. Um, do you happen to know when you're looking at it with the naked eye how to tell if it's actually Mars or Aries? Like, well, could you repeat the question? Yeah, okay. The um, question is. It, no, no, you joke so that the live stream people can. Yeah. The um, question is um, if you see a reddish thing in the sky, how can you tell if it's Mars or if it's Antares or some other reddish star? Well, okay. Antares is always in the same place in the sky. So if you, if you know the constellations at all, um, you, can, you can look up and you can say, there's Antares. Mars is a planet, so it wanders around in the sky. If, it's, if you see a reddish object in a place where your star map tells you there's no red stars, it's likely to be Mars. Uh, also, there's another way, a visual way, of determining whether a thing you see in the sky is a star or a planet. Um, Planets do not, generally speaking, do not twinkle. So stars often twinkle or fluctuate in brightness and even color as you look at them. It's because they're point sources of light and this various, very thin stream of light reaching you from these distant stars is easily messed up and distorted by the atmosphere. And that's what causes twinkling. A planet is a disk that you can see in a telescope. And because it's light is, its beam of light that's reaching us is wider, um, it, it, any twinkling sort of gets averaged out. And it sort of it makes it look a lot more stable. So um, yeah, this is especially easy to see in a bigger planet like Jupiter, where it's a very stable looking source of light. Oh, uh, more Greek mythology, Urania, the muse of astronomy. So yeah, it's another digital piece. I, I provided her with a nice classical 12-inch refractor telescope from the 19th century. Uh, and there's a few other odds and ends, uh, astronomical odds and ends. Her dress represents the celestial coordinates. And her belt is a comet. So it's got two tails. It's got the yellowish dust tail, which is curved, and the bluish ion tail, which is straight. So that's an acrylic painting, spatial painting. Um, that's part of a really extensive bunch of paintings I did for uh, Time Life books back in the 90s. Do you remember Time Life books? They used to send you junk mail all the time trying to, do you remember books? Yeah, they were once popular too. So this is a typical example of the kind of work I was doing for them. The, the shuttle is based on photographs I took of a shuttle plastic model kit I made. And, uh, there on the ground, you can see it's the Florida Peninsula. Should have brought my laser pointer, but I did not. But you can see the Florida Keys down there, and Lake Okeechobee, and stuff like that. You use the mouse on your oh, maybe I can do that. Uh, well, I'm not getting the uh, utmost in control doing that, so. <laughs> Oh, here's another shuttle uh, image. Um, that is kind of a hybrid image. It's, uh, it's partially digital, and it's also partially based on that same shuttle model kit I made. So that would be right after they got into orbit because of the engines are still hot and they haven't opened the uh, payload bay doors yet, which, which, which is the first thing they do, actually, or they did when they get into orbit. So it's, it's, it's a hybrid. 
Yeah. So the digital... What? As I recall... Yeah, I believe it was, yeah. Um, I think the shuttle itself is actually based on a photograph of the model that I, I, I stuck in there and then modified to look cooler. <laughs> okay, so um, these are lunar rovers, uh, remote control lunar rovers that were proposed to be sent to the moon as a commercial enterprise by a company called Blastoff around the turn of the century. And they hired me to do a bunch of uh, artwork for their project. And I'm also partially responsible for the design of those rovers. And uh, it all sounded pretty cool. Uh, they were gonna do things like they were gonna plant little national flags so the United States wouldn't be the only country up there with a flag. Uh, and they were gonna you know, do live video and stuff like that. Unfortunately, they, they failed to um, get the funding they needed. So after a couple of years, uh, the whole thing just disappeared. <laughs> but I still have this cool artwork. Oh, and uh, this is uh, more digital stuff. This is supposed to be uh, spaceport for purely tourist or commercial space flights. Um, trying to remember what I did. I think I did that for Space Adventures. Have you heard of them? Um, they they have been responsible for uh, putting well-heeled tourists on Russian Soyuz spacecraft and sending a few of them up to the space station and stuff like that. I think they're still in business. I'm not really sure what their business is these days. So yeah, that was back when it was thought that uh, these reusable tourist spacecraft would be like miniature space shuttles. And it would have jet engines on it to uh, propel it to an altitude where they could fire up the rockets and uh, make suborbital hops or maybe even orbital. So I more or less designed that. Not that it's a great work of the imagination because it's obviously based on the space shuttle. But the whole, all the other structures and things, I made those. And here's what space tourists were supposed to be like when they got into orbit. And there were these um, hypothetical spacecraft were supposed to have really big windows. I guess they still have the, the little hopping up and popping down ones that they're, they're using now. I guess they have pretty big windows, but I'm not terribly impressed with those. <laughs> I mean, they, they hop up 50 miles or whatever, and then they immediately fall down again. So I guess you get to say that you're an astronaut or something, but I don't really buy it. Oh, this is the cover for my Cosmic Cat children's book. Uh, and that is an oil painting. Oh, well, except for the uh, the logo, the text. You know, that's all digital. I'd be crazy to try and paint that in oil. And that's an interior page from the book. And then it's also a hybrid. The background is a painting, and the figure in the foreground is a digital based on a drawing. Uh, Mars is pretty popular, but I really haven't done a whole lot with it. So this is how it might look as seen from the Martian moon of Phobos. Except the, uh, the background, the star black background would not really be bright blue like that with all those brilliant stars. And that is an acrylic painting. And so is this uh, Martian sunset. It's based on it's a pretty old painting. Um, it's b the colors in the sky are based on what was sent back by the Viking landers in 1976. And you can see the Earth 
which is bluish, and the moon is next to it. And then the planet Venus is closer to the uh, sunset. And it was known back then that there's some cloud activity in the Martian atmosphere. So I included a few stars. I don't know if they, stars, clouds. I don't know if they ever assume these sunset colors like we have here on Earth, but whatever. Uh, yeah, this was um, part of a planetarium panorama I did for Moorhead Planetarium when they did a show about uh, Martian exploration. Uh, so yeah, I, I designed it, all those, all that hardware, and modeled it in 3D, and uh, stuck it into a, a landscape. Now the entire thing is a 360-degree panorama, uh, but I just chose a, one of the more interesting parts of it. <laughs> there's no sense if you're doing a planetarium panorama. There's no sense in devoting a lot of effort to the part that is over everybody's shoulder. And this is uh, this was intended to be a, a poster for that show, and yeah. So there's my rover model again. And the lander in the background, another one of my little designs, um, it's supposed to, on the bottom is the, the actual landing portion, and then when they're ready to return to their mothership, which would presumably still be in Martian orbit, they climb into what is essentially um, an Artemis or uh, Orion uh, or capsule um, th uh, thing with a a single rocket motor and a couple of small single uh, solid rocket boosters attached to it. So I don't know, that seemed like as plausible a method of doing it as any to me. Space nostalgia. Um, yeah, I did a bunch of illustrations for a guy who wanted to publish a magazine about space tourism. And that was like 10 years ago. He uh, he thought space, space tourism was going to take off any time because uh, various companies were predicting that, oh, yeah, we're going to have our first launch any day now. And, you know, it's just barely getting started now. So that poor guy, he put a lot of money into it, and it just flopped. And uh, I've noticed that uh, every time uh, some startup hires me to do something, they, they usually fail pretty quickly. So I don't know if I don't put that on my resume or anything. So what, what's going on here is that that kid is sitting there in his homemade spacesuit, and the Apollo 11 landing is on his little portable black and white TV. And he's daydreaming about what he might look like when he's old. And he's up, he's up in orbit looking out one of those big round windows while the space helmet floats around. So I, I tried to make his house look pretty retro with that terrible wallpaper and everything. I used to have a space helmet like that, like the one on the floor. Yeah, this is another one of my, this is intended to be a space garage under construction. And when it was complete, it would be enclosed, and you could put spacecraft in there for assembly or repair. And the astronauts who were working on them would have some small measure of protection from micrometeorites or something. And I figured that these things, to be really practical, would be habitable. So I included like these three habitation modules and uh, there's an Orion space vehicle shuttle ve uh, attached to it, and a bunch of fuel tanks and things. And solar dynamic power, uh, which was something that NASA was looking into for a long time, where sunlight would be concentrated on a sort of a reactor with uh, molten salt that would pass through a turbine or something to generate electricity. Okay, um, 
I was commissioned to do this gigantic thing for by um, this this outfit in Boulder, Colorado. I forget what they call themselves, the Space Science Institute or something like that. And they were doing a traveling exhibit of uh, about asteroids. And what this is is the uh, the Japanese. Um, let me see if I can remember this. Hayabusa probe, the first one. And that visited the asteroid Itakawa. Um, it, it was not terribly successful. It was intended to be a sample return mission, but it, it didn't manage to uh, actually scrape up much material. It didn't land. It didn't bounce off the surface properly or something like that. The, the Japanese have since sent a second one to a different asteroid that was more successful. Anyway, this thing was the, um, this was going to be made into a huge panel that could be transported and it was like 12 feet long and eight feet high or something like that. So this had to be a super high resolution image in order to print properly at that size. It was, <laughs> it was easily the, the biggest thing I've, biggest digital pizza I've ever done. And it was not easy with the, um, the computer hardware I could afford back then, around 2010 or something like that. Uh, so I actually tried to make a, a digital model of the asteroid, but I could not make one that was uh, adequately detailed. I made one that was okay for determining perspective, the point of view, um, but I wound up having to paint the asteroid. And um, then I, uh, I made a digital model of the spacecraft and composited that with the painting. Jupiter and Callisto is an old painting. Uh, looks like it's probably acrylic. Callisto is the outermost of the four Galilean moons of uh, Jupiter. Oh, this is even older, I think. That might be a gouache painting. I believe it is. Gouache is a, it's an opaque watercolor. Um, yeah, so you're seeing it from quite close up, obviously. <laughs> so you're seeing the moon Io there on the left, and the potato-like thing near the center is the, the moon Amalthea, and the great red spot on Jupiter is there as well. So Europa is famous for having a subsurface ocean of liquid water covered by uh, a layer of solid ice. And nobody knows exactly how thick that ice is. And it, I'm sure it varies substantially over the surface of the moon. So what I'm showing here is a hypothetical scene where uh, some tectonic activity or something is temporarily opened up the, uh, the ice and exposed some of the liquid water, which is now being exposed simultaneously to vacuum and uh, really low temperatures. So what it's actually doing is boiling uh, because of the vacuum. And it would, it would remain like that while it was freezing over again. So yeah, it's a weird situation for us earthbound people to consider And that is my design for a probe uh, that could be sent down through a hole that could somehow be drilled in the icy surface of Europa to penetrate down into the water and do some exploring. I figured the most, the easiest uh, shape for something like that would be like a torpedo, a long slender thing. Um, with lights on it that would be on little booms that would then extend once they were, um, once it was in the water. I hope we will someday actually have a mission like that because there's no telling what could be in there in that water. That's a digital piece. 
Okay, so another guy in Germany wrote a series of four novels about aliens called Kerfs, who were essentially insect-like beings who lived on the uh, floor of the ocean of Europa and had various conflicts with other tribes of Kerfs. And then they were also surprised to encounter uh, probes sent by Earth people. Now, so they were in Ger the books are in German, so I couldn't really read them. But uh, the guy, he told me what he wanted. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I designed the little submarine probe there. And um, the, the, uh, everything else is, is uh, digital, except for the kerf itself, which is uh, based on a pencil drawing and then hand painted in digitally. I don't know if he ever had much success with those books. I hope so, because they, they all had great covers. And that's a, an acrylic painting. I was just experimenting with uh, having a looser style for this thing. So yeah, a little jingoistic. He's probably trying to jam that flagpole down into the ice to reach the water. All right, and this is pure digital. So yeah, this one and the next one, it depicts the uh, Cassini um, Saturn orbiter. And it's a closer view of the spacecraft different point of view. The good thing about this kind of digital art is um, once you've made a good 3D model of a spacecraft or a planet or whatever, you can reuse it endlessly, and light it differently and show it from different positions and everything. You can even animate it. And yeah, this is a this is also digital, but it's a, it's essentially a, a recreation of a painting. One of the, one of the paintings I did for Time Life books. Uh, they retain the um, copyright for for most of those paintings, so I could not sell the rights to uh, other places. But I figured if I just made another one digitally, I'd, I'd be free and clear, so I could do that. Yeah. So all, all those little ring particles there, they're all separate little digital uh, 3D objects that had to be rendered. That's an acrylic painting. Uh, so that represents my idea of what the rings of Saturn would look like if you were hovering just above the main cloud deck of the planet Saturn. And obviously that would span the entire sky, which you can't show readily in a painting. Uh, I figure it would be a pretty weird thing to see. <laughs> uh, the the uh, closest thing I can think of to what that might look like is standing at the base of the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. Um, when you look up at that thing from that perspective, it looks pretty strange. And yeah. Saturn polar vortex, yeah. Okay, so that's digital. And um, there's this weird storm at the pole, I forget which pole, of Saturn that extends way down into the planet's atmosphere. Uh, and it's big. I forget exactly how big it is, but it's it's hundreds of miles across, maybe bigger. Yeah, what a dramatic scene. That would be <laughs> pretty freaky to see that in reality. Uh, Cassini got pictures of this thing and uh, other features in the atmosphere of Saturn, but it never got anywhere near close enough to uh, to show it with this level of detail.
And then there's Enceladus. Uh, it's another moon that's suspected to have uh, water ocean underneath an icy crust. Well, not, a, not just suspected, it's pretty much inevitable since it's got geysers of water that squirt out from the surface here and there. They must be coming from somewhere. Uh, yeah, most people pronounce it Enceladus, but uh, you know, classical Greece, Greek does not have a soft C sound. <laughs> All the C's you see are supposed to be hard C, so I'd say Enceladus. So it's like the uh, the Boston Celtic uh, basketball team. Celtics? No, no, I don't think so. Oh, here's the favorite planet of fifth graders everywhere. And that, that is an acrylic painting uh, showing the Voyager space probe. It's quite an old painting. I guess it dates from the late 70s. Um, and that was right after the uh, ring system of this planet was uh, discovered. Exploring Neptune. Okay, so this is a rework of one of those Time Life paintings um, with hypothetical spacecraft out at the planet Neptune and one of its tiny moons. And it, they, the, uh, the big round things on the front are arrow shields, so they, they could slow down when they reach the planet by sort of plowing through the upper layers of its atmosphere, slowing down that way. Question? Um, the arrow shields look like part of a soccer ball. Well, they may have been soccer fans. I don't know. So, uh, the former planet Pluto, um, this is another kind of a hybrid thing. The, uh, the mass of ice in the foreground is a painting. And I think the, the planet itself and the background also paintings. But all those little ice tablets, that's all digital. So yeah, you're seeing the planet, the surface of the moon Charon and Pluto's in the background. Now this is before we really knew what Pluto looked like because it was before the uh, New Horizons probe. So I was just purely guessing what it might be. And that's, that's the case with many of these things. <laughs> and let's see, kind of exaggerated view of a galaxy is seen through the slit of a really big observatory. Uh, purely digital. This is an acrylic painting. Exoplanets are hot these days. Um, astronomers detecting these planets in other solar systems <laughs> ah, were surprised to learn that many of them were massive planets like Jupiter, but also very close to their stars. Uh, so close that they're they're red hot because they're they're just so close to their star. Uh, this came as a surprise because, <laughs> as a sort of failure of imagination, we kind of figured that well our solar system is like this and we're perfectly normal here, so uh, other solar systems are probably about the same. Um, but we're discovering now that this is not the case, which I think is healthy. This is a completely hypothetical exoplanet, a couple of moons. It's just intended to be a pretty scene, and it's uh, purely digital. Uh, well, except the, sm the moon, the round moon, See the texture on it. Um, that came from the surface of a frozen pond. I took a picture of it and mapped it onto a sphere. And it wound up looking like that. Question? Yeah. Um, the exoplanet looks like Saturn. 
Well, it has rings, yeah. Um, you can maybe infer what they would look like if you could see them more clearly from the shadow on the planet. This is an oil painting. Um, it's actually you know, part of a science fiction book cover I did. Um, but by itself, it's just another exoplanet kind of a deal with uh, um, uh, an Earth-like planet this time and a kind of a fanciful nebular scene that is really, really bright and colorful. Black holes. Everybody likes a black hole. Okay, so here we see the accretion disk of a black hole. And it's, it's uh, pulling material off of a neighboring star. Uh, this is a pretty old painting. And it's also pretty old fashioned. It's not really, would not really be considered a good representation of a black hole now because it doesn't have any of the optical distortion features that you see in like the movie Interstellar. So, um, if it w but nobody was doing that back then. Nobody really thought about it. So, so uh, if, if I tried to make it more realistic, first of all, I'd probably need a supercomputer to calculate how it would really be. And I'd have to be smart enough to tell the computer how to do that. Um, so yeah, this is not, this is, this is nice in its day, but it would no longer be considered a prime illustration of a black hole. And that's pretty much the same thing. It's pretty though. And that is a gouache painting. And it's really old. It probably dates from the 1980s. I don't know what happened to it. I mean, most of these paintings are long gone and sold a long time ago. Okay, this is a digital piece that was commissioned by Sky and Telescope magazine. And it's called a frame dragging black hole because the idea is that a rotating black hole, uh, its intense gravity would actually sort of drag the fra fabric of space and time around with it and distort it. Um, and this was, this was a popular image when I produced it. It was widely published in various places, sometimes without my permission. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Galaxy M31. This is, we're seeing, this is the great Andromeda galaxy, which is easy to see in a telescope. It's the, the nearest really big galaxy to our own. It's, it's something like 2.4 million light years away. Um, you can see it with a telescope, and if you've got a dark sky, you can even see it with the naked eye a little bit. Um, now, the point of view we have here is different because we're actually looking over its shoulder towards the Milky Way galaxy, which is the spiral in the upper left. And uh, yeah, so we don't see it from that angle. Oh, okay. A friend of mine commissioned this painting. He wanted it to include everything, a little bit of everything. It's an acrylic painting. So you see the observatory, galaxy, nebulas, planets, constellations. A lot of work. But it came out pretty well. Okay, now we're getting into some more recent stuff. Um, I only work small now. Yeah. Whoa, okay. Uh, I will think about that as I continue, and if I come up with an answer, I'll let you know. Now, this is, this is a tiny painting. It's like this. And I only work small now 
because they're so much more portable and easy to ship and stuff like that. And this particular technique is fun because what you do is you start out with a black panel and then over that you paint various transparent oil colors. And because they're transparent, but when you get done with that, it still looks black. And then what you do is you start painting in with white and it picks up the underlying color and you get lots of interesting effects that way. So that's a relatively quick and easy way to paint this kind of thing. So, okay, here's Earth and Moon. This is another tiny painting. Um, I don't know, you might look at that and you might say, uh, gee, Joe, that looks kind of uh, undetailed and messy and sloppy compared to some of your earlier work. And I might say, well, I'm trying to go for a looser, more impressionistic style. Or I might just say, well, I'm getting more lazy. <laughs> I'm going with the second explanation. So this is a, a palette knife painting, which I don't really do that much of. It's an experiment primarily. The only thing that isn't laid down with a palette knife is the, uh, the crescent of the big planet there. It's barely astronomical in my opinion, but I think it's kind of cool. Uh, and this is really fanciful. This uh, is supposed to represent a comet passing very close to Saturn very active comet. So it's uh, blasting off lots of um, gas and stuff into space and forming a, an, an atmosphere around itself. Um, so the sky is not black. So the thing that makes it fanciful is that no comet that's as far away from the sun as Saturn would be active like that. So whatever, it's, it's fantasy. But it's cool, a little bit. This is a tiny oil painting. I just, it was just something I blasted out for fun. So, a selection of galaxies. And this is a tiny acrylic painting with a hypothetical moon and planet. I call it Sapphire Towers. And this is the last thing I did. In fact, uh, it's still on my drawing board. And I just put the last paint on it a couple of days ago. And I call it Wild Galaxies. And it's really tiny. It's like six inches by eight or something like that. And that's all I have to say. And I thank you all for coming and listening to me. I'm still trying to think of what the hardest painting would be, but I mean, there have been so many, hundreds and hundreds of paintings over the decades. That, and they're not all space art either. I do other stuff, so. No, no. I've, I've fiddled around with that once or twice, but it didn't really catch my interest. What's the process you go through for a digital uh, painting? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, if it involves spacecraft, um, I will usually make a 3D model um, that I can uh, then pose and manipulate. Uh, let's see, what else? Otherwise, in many cases, it's a lot like a regular painting, real painting, except you're using a stylus. Um, and then once you have all the elements you need, you sort of composite them. Um, did you have any background in art before you taught yourself to paint? Yes. Uh, I was a class artist in high school. Uh, and. Uh, while I was learning to paint, I was also a, a student at uh, 
uh, Binghamton University, and I got a degree in studio art from there. And uh, I didn't really learn that much about painting there, to be honest, because uh, the professors, they didn't really teach anything about painting. Even in the painting classes, all they really did was uh, they said, well, paint something. And then by the time you got it done, they, they told you if it was any good or not. They, there was no talk whatsoever about technical ways of handling paint or anything like that. So I had to, I had eventually, yeah, I had to teach myself how to do all that stuff. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was fun, though. It was I've con I've considered trying to do things like that, but I guess it, that laziness is just <laughs> too overpowering. <laughs> Did you teach yourself by practicing? Yeah, yeah. Well, I taught myself by practicing and also by imitating other space artists who I liked. So I went to uh, science fiction conventions, and um, the artists who really influenced me the most at those were Rick Sternbach and Ron Miller, and I saw a lot, you, have you heard of them? Uh, um, yeah, so they had a lot of original art hanging at those things, and uh, they're friends of mine now. Um, Sternbach was perhaps best known for being the primary designer for Star Trek The uh, Next Generation, and other Star Trek uh, projects as well. Anything else? Okay. So from Mark Bowen, he asks, what kind of printer is used to reproduce these amazing images? Uh, guessing dye sublimation for the digital images? Okay, the, uh, I don't need to have a color printer anymore. Um, what you're seeing on the screen, they're, they're just the, uh, <laughs> they're just the, the digital images straight from the computer. They're not printed. And actually, a question for me. Um, what's your workflow for bringing in 3D models into your digital artwork? And is it is a final result a mixed digital media, for lack of a better term? Well, I usually use a program called Strata something or other. They keep changing the name of the program, but it's from Strata. And uh, the usual procedure is to create the geometry first. Um, or the actual shapes and assemble them and then you make textures which are also usually digitally created. You um, attach the correct texture to the correct part. Uh, you assemble the model, uh, you light it, um, and then you render it. Um, and then Astronomy Web asks, uh, my, my question is, how do you balance the art with the science of a piece? I really don't think much about that. Uh, and unless, unless I'm working for a client that has specific needs, I don't, really don't worry too much about the science. I'm, I'm just trying to make nice pictures. Um, but, you know, well, one of the things I did was astronomers from Canada, they contacted me. They had discovered an extremely distant galaxy, but their image was like 17 pixels across or something, and they wanted a better image. So they commissioned me to do a painting, and I had to base my painting on their 17 pixel image as closely as possible. So, but I, tr I didn't take a lot of, uh, um, well, I, I, I was careful to uh, stick to the uh, original material as much as possible. But of course, I had to make up most of the detail right. because it wasn't there in, yeah. the, in the image. Lots to extrapolate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, well, that looks like the questions from the live chat. Yeah. So, so Joe, uh, I realize, I mean, like that, that one very large image uh, probably took more time than some of these others, but like, on, on the average, if there is one, how much time does it take to, you know, from initial, you know, initially to sit down to, to start putting ideas together to, to finally coming up with a product? 
Yeah, it's really variable depending on how elaborate it is. Like the space shuttle painting I showed, um, paintings like that, they were fairly big and, and they had to be very detailed. That is like two weeks of solid work. Um, the asteroid one that Drew is referring to, I had so much trouble with that one. It's probably more like a month. And, uh, but some of the quicker things, like the last few I showed, uh, the tiny quick uh, paintings, uh, maybe 10 hours, something like that. But, it, you know, it's still, it still work. Anything else? Any other questions from the audience or on the live stream? All right. Thanks, All right. everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. It's, uh, it's actually been great to sort of reconnect with Joe. As Joe mentioned, uh, uh, we were high school classmates. Uh, and uh, we all went off in our own direction. And uh, I eventually came back here to the, to the southern tier. And uh, once I started working here, that's when I started to re-engage with Joe. And it's just sort of nice, to, nice to reconnect. So thank you again for uh, sharing your, your artwork and, uh, uh, with us. And um, we actually do actually have a couple of, of the uh, Cosmic uh, Cat uh, DVDs uh, okay. in the store. So if you're interested in checking that out, that's available. Yeah. Oh, uh, Cosmic Cat, there's also a, a digital version available on Apple Books. It's intended to uh, play on iPads. And it has a lot of additional material, animations and things. If you're interested in that, it's, it's educational and fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, for those uh, who've been here before know my rule, and for those that that haven't been here before, you're going to find out my rule is you cannot leave Copernic until you look through a telescope. And as it turns out, the moon is out. So um, I think it's time to head straight through the, uh, the lobby. Uh, and then, uh, uh, Ben, if you would sort of point them into the six inch telescope and you get a chance to uh, take a look at the, it's a, a gibbous moon. And uh, look in particular at, at, the, um, at the Terminator where the, where the light uh, goes from light to darkness on the moon. Check out the shadows. They're really quite, uh, quite stunning. But thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Thanks again on the live stream. And uh, next week, we actually have two live streams coming up. On Tuesday, NASA is going to be revealing the first images from the James Webb Telescope. We will be simulcasting the NASA stream, as well as we have a Copernic Astronomic Society member who will be at Goddard Space Flight Center and actually be connected in, sort of providing some color commentary to us. So that'll be on our, on our YouTube live stream. And then Friday, uh, Friday evening, our, our next Friday evening program is going to be all about the James Webb Telescope. And we'll be even having uh, Dr. Michelle Thaller will zoom in and give us uh, sort of her, uh, her view of uh, what an, an amazing, uh, uh, amazing instrument this is. Actually, her, her late husband worked on the James Webb for many years. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed before it actually got a chance to like, get launched. So uh, she, the James Webb has got a real special place in her heart. So uh, anyway, thanks again for coming. And head on out to the scopes. Yeah, you have a question. What's the YouTube channel? It's, uh, the YouTube channel is called Copernic Observatory. So if you just go to YouTube, Copernic Observatory, and spell it the way we spell it, there's no C in Copernic. Um, and it, what's, again, what's also great about it is that all of our YouTube streams are, are stored there. So you can go back and you can look at Jeremy's uh, um, uh, eclipse. You can look at the uh, Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. And so we've got literally probably over 100, 100 live streams. All right. Well, thanks again.